the last round, all the lights flashing, crowds going crazy. Here comes the voice. He's out of control, can't be stopped. Everyone knows that he's on top. Welcome to Las Vegas, the fight capital of the world, and welcome to The Voice Versus. Hello everybody, I'm Michael Chiavello. My guest today on The Voice Versus is the man who took mixed martial arts from obscure blood sport to worldwide phenomenon. His name, Dana White. The president of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, Dana White has been labelled controversial, brash, abrasive and outspoken, but now you can make up your own mind. So strap yourselves in for one hour of awesomeness for The Voice versus Dana White. Dana White, thank you for joining me on The Voice versus. It's an absolute pleasure. Same here. I want to start by asking, I'm actually a little bit distracted. Okay, first of all, the Yakuza sex photo in the background here. Right. Please explain. But yeah, it's an Iraqi. I have a good friend of mine, uh, Richie Sachs, who called me up one day and said, I want you to write me a, a check for this amount of money. I said, for what? And he says, you'll see. So I wrote him a check. I said, all right, I'm in, I'll play. I wrote him the check, and that showed up in the mail. <laughs> so I was like, what the hell am I going to do with this thing? I can't hang it up in my office. I can't put it in my house. So I ended up putting the thing in storage, right? So it was sitting in storage, and when we did the fight out in Japan, the guy who I bought all my art from here you know, uh, in London, he says, so I heard you got the uh, Iraqi Yakuza. <laughs> what did you do with it? And I said, I got it in storage. He looked at me like I just told him the most horrible thing he's ever heard. And uh, he's like, are you crazy? And he told me what that picture is worth. Full pocket for me. He told me what that picture is worth. Let's put it this way. <laughs> I was at dinner. I picked up the phone and called my secretary and said, get that thing out of storage wow. and bring it to the office. And it's been hanging there ever since. But every time somebody comes to my office now, I got to explain the story to him. Of course. That's a great talking a, point. Uh, it is a great talking like point. Like there's a crazy picture like that in my <laughs> office. When word got out that this interview was agreed to, it happened via the fans over Twitter, which is a great thing to see. I was approached on Twitter, on Facebook, on email by journalists, promoters, fans who asked me to use this interview to go after you, to go after your jugular, so to speak, right. to attack you, to expose the UFC. They threw out words like corruption, athletic commission, unions, tyranny, bully. Right. They wanted me to go for the kill. I want to say it's not how this interview is going to go. Yeah. I've got a tremendous amount of respect for you and I well, think that everyone in this room here owes you a debt of gratitude or we wouldn't be here in this capacity that we are today. But I'd like to <laughs> ask you though, that. for those people who said, Chevello, go after his jugular, go for the kill, what would you like to say to those people and their agenda? You can ask me anything you want to ask me. You know what I mean? There's never, um, I'm sure, you know, th this interview didn't go through PR and mm. a lot of them don't. People want to set up interviews with me. I'll give anybody an interview. And, and there's never, you will never be in a situation in this company where our PR people will set up an interview and say, here's what you can and here's what you can't talk about. You'll never have our PR staff going out and trying to protect me or, or cover the UFC's ass or anything like that. It's, it's never been like that and it never will be. I want to quote a story from the Fox Sports website written about you in 2011. I quote, some hate him, some love him, some fear him, some resent him, some respect him. Some see a brilliant, game-changing, hard-charging catalyst at the center of the rise of the UFC and mixed martial arts. Some see wildly magnetic bully they can't stand. Many see him as a combination of all these things. How do you see yourself and what sort of person you are? I don't, I don't see myself as anything, but I wouldn't disagree with one word of that. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that's how many different people see me. That's a fact. And it depends on who you are and, and, and what your agenda is or how you deal with me. Um, you know, if you're a guy, look at this. I mean, I've done business over the last 13 years with the biggest media companies in the world. I've done uh, business with thousands of fighters with tons of different egos, uh, records, and, and you know, you name it. I, I mean, I've been in business with everybody. And it depends on how you want to do business and how you want to do business with me or us. I shouldn't even say us. I should just say me. Because you don't always have to just deal with me. If you so, can't deal with me, maybe you can deal with Lorenzo. It sounds like you're a bit of a mirror. So people 
Treat you well, you'll treat them well. Treat, so, people treat you like a devil, you'll treat them back that same way. You're a mirror to what they are giving you. Great way to put it. You know, if you want to be a good guy, I'm a great guy. If you want to be a bad guy, I'm the worst bad guy you ever met. You're a passionate businessman. You're also a passionate father. You know, I saw on YouTube the other day this amazing clip about this dad who had built a roller coaster in his backyard <laughs> for his son, and I thought it was right, amazing. Right. Now, you haven't built a roller coaster, but you did build a Pop Warner football team here in Vegas that your son plays in. I hear he's quite both the... Both sons, yeah. Both, both sons. Do, yep. And I hear Dana Jr. is quite the star quarterback of this team. Right. And this team is fully fitted out. They've got the best uniforms, the best coach, the best facilities. You, you know, did your homework, man. Yeah, I'm Nobody going. has ever asked me that question, before, and nobody's ever known that before. Yeah, I don't I'm think. I'm amazed. Anyway. Tell me about this football team. I don't know how or why, but my son is a huge football fanatic. He didn't get it from me. Um, and, you know, he wanted to play football. So we started with flag football and I funded our, our football flag football team. He played that for three years. He won the championship two of the three years. Then we ended up getting a, a football team, which Lorenzo helped me build because Lorenzo's a hardcore football guy. We got this coach. Actually, his name is Coach White. <laughs> right. And Coach White is is uh, is awesome. He he works great with little kids, and we started to recruit all these kids um, in the city of Vegas, and we built this this tackle football team, the Cowboys. And uh, yeah, two years that the Cowboys have been around, we've won uh, we've won the uh, the Super Bowl both years. Tremendous. Yeah. Now, is it true that when you can't make it to games, you have someone go and record the game and stream it to you live? So stream you it live. It? Yeah, if I can't be at the games because we have a fight or I'm out of town or whatever, we stream the games live to me and uh, I watch them live. Kids can talk to me right through the TV and yeah, I don't miss anything. And it's not just it's just not not just football games. I mean, we stream their events at school, anything that I can't uh, be there to watch and see, we stream. Amazing. From the sounds of it and what you've done, you're, you're a great dad who's done some amazing things for his kid. Are you driven by a desire to make sure their childhood is better than yours was to provide whatever was lacking maybe materially or emotionally in your own childhood? No doubt about it, yeah. What I do is I try to expose my kids to everything and then they'll figure out what it is they love and don't love. You know, I, I was very fortunate that uh, even though we didn't have a lot of money, I was able to grow up on the East Coast and the West Coast. Lived here in Las Vegas, but spent a lot of summers back in, you know, whether it was uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, or Maine, I got to spend time back there every, every summer. And, and I think that, uh, I don't know. I think it just it it expands your your uh, your mind as a kid. You meet new people and do new things, um, and I, and I definitely want that for my kids too. What do you think was most lacking from your childhood that you try to give your kids today, or you try and you know stay away from and not make the mistakes that were made in your own childhood? Well, it's one of the things that if I said I was good at anything, I was always good at you know learning from my mistakes and other people's mistakes, and I think that uh, the one thing, for instance, my kids. Um, they don't have they don't have a summer off. They go to school all year round. Our school isn't in all year round. School, they're on regular school years, but the actual teachers that work for the school come to our house in California and uh, teach them all summer too. I introduce them to all sports, and it's, we're not talking baseball, basketball. My kids skateboard, they uh, snowboard, they do wrestling, jujitsu, muay thai, boxing, um, football. I mean, they're into everything. They, they do so many different things. You are one of the most visible men in the world of mixed martial arts, in the world of sports, really. However, your wife and kids seem to be completely out of the spotlight. Is that through a conscious effort on your part to maintain the separateness between Dana White, the public figure, and Dana White, the private figure, and keep your family removed from that spotlight? No doubt about it. Yeah, absolutely. Not just mine, but my wife. Uh, my wife w would never get in front of a camera. And actually, one time, ESPN the magazine, did an interview, and I, I, I talked her into doing it once. Took forever, I talked her into it, and they turned everything she said around, yeah. and she said she'll never do it again. You know, speaking of childhood, you were a former classmate of Lorenzo Fatita, which leads me to wonder what you two were like in class. I mean, were you like the Kevin Arnold and Paul Pfeiffer of school, or were you more like Zach and Screech? How were you two interacting in school as, as mates? I was an idiot. I was an <laughs> idiot. I got kicked out of school twice. Lorenzo was a model student and, uh, you know, captain of the football team. Me and Lorenzo were on two totally different paths, believe me. You got kicked out of school twice. Was twice. It the, the same, same sc school twice. For what? The first time I got kicked out of school was for fighting. The second time I, I got kicked out of school the second time because uh, <laughs> we, we went to Catholic school and we literally had nuns still then, you know, uh, you know, fully dressed nuns. And uh, one, of the, one of the nuns, used to leave her, her door open. We had an old building. Gorman 
isn't what it is today. Gorman was a really old school that we went to, and now it's beautiful and growing, and it's, it, it's a phenomenal campus. It's like a college campus now. She used to leave her door open every day. And one day I was walking by, I was going to the bathroom, and I, you know, you're an idiot, you're young, you decide, I decided to kick the door shut. And they were these heavy metal steel doors. So when I kicked the door shut, it slammed loud, it freaked everybody out. And literally she didn't teach class anymore. She was so freaked out by the <laughs> thing, she didn't even teach. So all the kids that were in that class got out. Wow. They, didn't get to, they didn't have to do school. So, you know, the kids that knew I did it asked me to do it again. So I kept doing it every day, kicking her door shut, and she was on a mission to catch me. So you, you might remember this, you know, you grew up in Australia, but mm -hmm. remember topsider shoes? Yeah, yeah. So I was wearing topsiders. Oh, so that would have flown off your feet. One day, <laughs> one day the shoe flew off my foot, and I had to run with no shoe. I had no sock on, and uh, she came back into the class with the topsider, and she goes, I got him. <laughs> she got me. And that was what I got kicked out of school for the second time. I understand your frustration, though. I also grew up in a Catholic school. My school is run by Jesuits and nuns. And I think that's the reason why we both went bald so early. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure from an early Catholic, Catholic schooling. Right. You like to swear a lot. You've been pretty good in this interview, though, I must say. You've Thank cleared you. your swearing. But studies show that swearing can be a mechanism to increase pain tolerance, to establish identity as a member of a group, or even to mask insecurity. Do you have any theories as to why you curse so much? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely insecure. <laughs> <laughs> I like swearing. And, and, and it bothers me when people uh, are like, you know, talk about swearing. We're all adults here. Who cares? At the end of the day, if I say shit, does it change your life whatsoever? My best but friend. fuck is my favorite. I mean, you see it. It's hanging on my wall yeah. right when you walk yeah. in the door. Fuck is my favorite word. And there's one up there. Pay attention, motherfuckers. Yep. It's my yeah. favorite word. I love that word. What do you think of your unofficial nickname, Dana fucking White? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fitting because my name <laughs> is Dana F. White. I, I actually call myself Dana fucking White sometimes. <laughs> you mentioned in a Playboy interview that you went to a shady doctor when you were younger and got pills and injections for weight gain admitting to steroid use in the interview. Right. How did your personal experience affect your stance on PADs in, in sports today? Well, the one thing that it did for me and in in, in that I know is when you, when you do that shit, you feel like Superman, you know, because I did. When I was that age and I did it, I, I felt like I was Superman. You feel invincible. But um, the long-term effects of it, when you get off it, it does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Once you're on it, you feel like Superman. Once you're on, off it, you feel like fucking Lois Lane. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it, it's, uh, if you're a professional athlete who's good enough to play on their natural abilities, keep it that way. Coming up on The Voice versus Dana White. This is the fight business. I always tell people when they say, this guy's disrespecting the sport and he's this and that. This isn't the accounting business. It's the fight business, man. You know, you promote mixed martial arts, a portion of which emanates from traditional martial arts. Are you a fan of traditional martial arts or could you not care less about them? No, I'm very much a, a fan. I, uh, I grew up a fan of a uh, of fighting period. I liked all kinds of fighting, but um, I was a huge Bruce Lee fan. Uh, and I like Chuck Norris and I mean, all the guys, Van Damme, all the guys that you would imagine growing up and watching the martial arts movies. So I've always been a fan, but Bruce Lee was really my, uh, my guy. Are most of the fighters in UFC today martial artists or are they fighters? Well, I, I think there's a big difference between martial artists and fighters. I, th I think that they have the martial arts spirit, but I, they're fighters. Does it say something about the appeal of traditional martial arts that the biggest draw in the UFC, George St. Pierre, comes from a traditional martial arts background and still stays true to that background in his presentation, his respect of his opponents, he's wearing the gi out to the cage. What does that say still for the place of traditional martial arts in, in the UFC? I think it's one of the fantastic things about the sport. When I first got involved in the sport and started to meet the athletes, the one thing that I loved is how different they were than boxing in, in that they had so much respect for each other and two guys could hang out you know, in the same area and not get into a fight. You know, we have our moments where, where guys are, uh, <laughs> you know, not friendly and, mm -hmm. and, and we, you know, have their moments, but yeah. Does it disappoint you sometimes or do you feel that there's a little bit more of a thug attitude that has entered mixed martial arts than, you know, what used to exist? It doesn't bother me. No, it doesn't bother me. This is the fight. This is the fight business. I always tell people when they say, this guy's disrespecting the sport and he's this and that. This isn't the accounting business. It's the fight business, man.
In an interview with Sports Illustrated, you once said, and I quote again, you are never dealing with good people in boxing, never. By what percentage are there better people in mixed martial arts do you feel than in boxing? And if you, you know, why do you believe MMA attracts a better type of person than boxing does? 100%, I, w- I would say 100%. Really? Yeah, you're dealing with 100% better people in, in mixed martial arts than you are in boxing. And, uh, you, you, and, and unfortunately in boxing, you do, you do deal with thugs. What do you think it is about mixed martial arts that attracts a better person to it? I think it's the martial arts. The Bushido spirit, that code No doubt of about it. And people always, you know, it's one of the million things that I'm always criticized about, but it's one of the reasons that I keep the money out of the, you know, the, the, the numbers out of the, what, what guys really make away from the public. As soon as people realize how much money's being made over here by these athletes, that's when all the creepy, slimy guys start slithering their way into mixed martial arts. Well, their fingers arts. in the pie, yeah. Despite saying boxing has become your father's sport, a quote you've used before, your background's in boxing, of course. You own boxing gyms yourself. You boxed as an amateur. Do you feel that boxing and MMA can coexist peacefully or is combat sports a zero-sum game in your mind? They can coexist. There's no doubt about it. I love boxing. Um, I love the sport. And if there's a good boxing fight on, I'll watch it. The problem with boxing is, is that the guys who run boxing have not and will not invest a dime to to, to save the future of the sport plus a lot of these guys are so old school and they think they're so they think they're so fucking smart they really do and they're the furthest thing from it you know now you heard all the stuff that they talked about us throughout the years now they're starting to copy the stuff that we did with the exception of oscar de la hoya Mm -hmm. and a couple of other guys out there who, who gave us our credit and gave us our props even don king even Don King, you know, when I would do these things for Spike, like the video game awards or whatever award show they would have and, and Spike would have me be a presenter or whatever it was. One time I went and it was the video game awards and Don King was there. I'd never met him at that time, right? I walked into the, into the green room back there and Don King's back there and it's packed with all these people. And he says, Dana White, the greatest promoter in the history of the world and this and that, and, you know, I never even met the guy. It's the first time I ever met him when I met him. You know, he, he told me what you guys have done with this thing is amazing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Bob Arum, he, he's just a, he's just a, Bob Arum's a piece of shit. That's the best way I could describe that guy. He's just a piece of shit. Have you met Bob? I, oh yeah, I've met Bob. When I was younger, um, when I first came to Vegas, I wanted to work for Bob Arum. That was the guy that I wanted to work for. You have no idea how fucking happy I am that that didn't happen. <laughs> I'm so happy that that didn't happen. That guy's such a piece of shit that if I would have worked over there, it would have it been a totally different, it would have been a negative boxing experience yeah. and I probably wouldn't have stuck around in combat sports. In a Playboy interview a few years ago, you said meeting a big name boxer in his 30s who was already punch drunk was one reason you decided not to pursue a career as a fighter. How big a name was that guy and is he someone we might know? Yeah, no, he wasn't a big name, uh, you know, nationally or internationally, but he was a big name in Boston where, where I was. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like at one point in my life when I was younger, I felt that that's what I wanted to do so bad that that was what I, I really wanted. And then I saw him and I said, God, what would happen if I ended up like that? And what if this, and what if that? And that was the day that I realized that I didn't have it to, to, to be a fighter because fighters don't ask what if they don't ever I mean, I've known so many guys mm-hmm. that are real fighters and will actually go on a skid where they lose a bunch in a row and they're still. Yeah. And it's literally what they, they believe it and I know it, that that's what they were put on this earth to do. I mean, that's who they are to the bone. Well, and, to, and, and, I, and I realized that one day, and there were other things too. For instance, like for a long time, I battled over, I wanted one pro fight. Yeah. I battled with it for a long time. I was here in Vegas. I could do it. But you know what? At that time, my business, I would have to take three months off from my business. And, and, uh, and I wasn't willing to do that. There's, there's, there's example number two of why I wasn't a real. And I could probably come up with four or five more why. You know, I agree with you. I've been covering fight sports since 1992, so 21 years now. And all the fighters I've known over the years, they seem to have, I can't put my finger on what it is. You might be able to explain it better, but there's a switch that fighters can switch on, that they go from being what we would assume a normal person to fighter mode, that they can switch in between, and maybe you just didn't have that switch in you to be able to flick that switch. 
No, but there, but there's. I understand what you're saying about that, but there's a switch that they have on that they can never turn off, mm. meaning they don't ever, they don't ever doubt or think. Oh, well, what if this doesn't work out for me? Well, prime example, they don't ever think like that. Prime example: the guys that go too far, they keep having one more fight, one more fight, one more fight, and end up punchy. Not even, not even that. The one more fight. But what about the guys who who go on the skid? All right, you're not in the UFC anymore. Then you lose in this organization. You go over here and you go over here. At what point do you say, you know what? I better start thinking about getting a real job. Yeah. They never think like that. That live, it never happens. That live just in the moment and don't invest or think in the future. Yeah. Don't think years ahead. It's it's sad and it happens yeah. to a lot of fighters. Yeah. Is it sad though? L- let me ask you a question. When people ask, is it sad? Isn't that sad that that happens to that guy? That guy is living his life exactly the way he wants to. You know what I think is sad? Yeah. I think it's sad is, have you ever seen the, 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 um, the I think it's called the Vici, the video levels? No. You never seen the video levels? No. It's a video. Avicii is a song. You'd know the song if you heard it. Oh, sometimes I get that. Feel. Yes, you know, okay. That's yeah. that song, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you watch the video, it's about this guy who goes to work and he's in this office that's smaller than my office. He's in this thing and they're all in desks and cubicles and stuff. And he just starts to flip out. It's, it's what the thing is about. That's what I think is sad. And what I think is sad is when I used to get up, and this isn't, and I'm not putting anybody down who does these types of jobs and does these things, but I think to each his own. Everybody has to live their life the way that they want to. When I was driving to work every day when I worked in the hotel business, dude, I was fucking miserable. Yeah. When I say miserable, I was making good money. I was making good money. I only had to work an eight-hour shift. I was young. You know, I was 19 years old. I was making cash. I had health benefits. They had 401k. They had all that shit that you think you're supposed to, that's supposed to be what you're looking for. But you knew you weren't doing what your heart really, what you knew you could, you know, to the most of your abilities. You knew I can do so much more than this, and that, you weren't able to do that. That wasn't for me, and that's the way these guys are built. That's how they are. Do you think there are some mixed martial arts fighters out there that could act as similar deterrents to people getting into mixed martial arts, like that boxer was a deterrent to you becoming a pro. Right, no doubt about it. Yeah, th- there's that. And the minute that happens to you, this isn't what you were meant to do. Yeah. This, what we do here is not for everybody. When I talk about real fighters and guys who make it to be the elite best in the world, it is a tiny, tiny percentage of the, of the world population are those guys who can actually have everything that it takes, physically, mentally, and emotionally, to get to that level. And the minute you start to doubt, the minute you start to wonder, the minute you start to look at another guy and go, uh-oh, see ya. Yeah. You're, you're not that guy. Up next on The Voice Versus. And I always think now, the kid probably sees me on TV now and goes, we beat the shit out of that guy one night. <laughs> you like as a boxer? I'm intrigued. What, what were you, you know, strategically, technically, what were you like? Did you have a good jab? Did you have a good cross? Did you have a good hook? What was your I, I, best I combo? Had a, I had a good jab and I had I had really good defense. Yeah? I had a good jab and I had really good defense. Didn't have much orthodox. of a right hand. South no. poor orthodox. Pat Militich came here one time, right? And me and Pat Militich sparred. He's a southpaw. I could never, ever box with southpaws. Just throw the right hand Let me tell you long. what. Me and, me and Pat Militich have had some fallings out. You know, we've had sure. some, some, some back and forth and whatever it was, you know, and, and, and I've said publicly before, the, the way that the, the Pat Militich thing was handled was, was bad and it was my fault and I accept 100% responsibility for it and I apologize to him. But Pat Militich, when he talked about when he and I sparred, was very kind to me. Hmm. Pat Militich lit me up like a fucking Christmas tree when he was out here. I've never been able to spar with Southpaws. Um, for some reason, I, I could never figure them out. So no, I was not a southpaw, and I hate southpaws. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a huge boxing fan. I know that Mike Tyson is one of your favorite boxers of all times, and you know you're friends with Mike now. Tell me about your relationship with Mike. The Mike Tyson era of boxing was the best. It was so amazing, and anybody who grew up in that era remembers what it was like. It was just when he would walk out, and a, and a Tyson fight was happening. Man, you just knew something crazy was going to happen, and you, it was just this this buzz of excitement. And now, to be really good friends with him, he was just here the other day. He was here the other day with his wife hanging out. And, you know, uh, it's a little surreal sometimes, and he's the one guy 
that still gets me a little antsy, you know, when he comes around and Mike's in the room. And I've got to ask, it. though, is it easy to forgive a convicted rapist, well, given that you've got a daughter as well? Yeah, it, it depends on whether you believe he did it or not. Let me tell you what, bro. I live in the real world, and I, I, I've, I've seen the way a lot of this stuff goes down. I've seen what happened to Mike Tyson, um, you know, without really getting into all the, the, the back and forth on that. Um, I, I don't believe he did it. I honestly don't believe he did it. And anybody who knows Mike wouldn't believe he did it. You used to teach boxing to businessmen, to housewives in Boston for a time. And then something happened one day. You're in class and a guy called Kevin Weeks walks into the gym. Now, for those that don't know, he's a standover guy, a shakedown guy, tough guy, running with the Waddy Bolger and the Winter Hill gang at the time. Big time, hardcore criminals. Tell me what you remember of that situation. Tell us a story of what went down that day. I was actually in, in, the, in the Boston Athletic Club and I was... Uh, teaching my class and these two guys walked right in the middle of the class and said they need to talk to me. So I'm thinking, Are these guys the fucking, they own this place or something? I mean, I, I understand. So I said, I'm teaching a class here. They're like, yeah, yeah, we want to talk to you. So we walk outside the class. I start talking to these guys and they start telling me that I own money. Hmm. And I'm like, uh, you know, it took me about three and a half seconds to realize <laughs> who they were then. The first thing he asked me is, you know who I am? I said, no, I don't know who you are. And then I started to figure out who he was. And basically they told me that they wanted the money. And uh, I said, I don't have it. And they said, well, you better figure it out. You know, borrow it from your girlfriend, they said. They said she doesn't have it either. You know, that was it. Then they left. I went back in, I taught my class, then tried to lay low and avoid them for as long as I could. And, uh, you know, Eventually, one day, I got a call at my house, and uh, they said, you basically owe us the money by tomorrow, by 1 wow. o'clock tomorrow. I said, I don't have it. And they said, we don't care. You better get it. I said, okay. I bought a plane ticket. L literally left everything I owned in Boston. Packed a suitcase with some clothes. Your girlfriend went with you? No, she stayed. You left your girlfriend as She's well. married now, has kids. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever hear from him again once he left town? Never again. Right after that, you know, months after that, they all got busted. Yeah. Everything went down, started digging up bodies. I think Kevin Weeks turned informant and uh, yep. yeah. You know, that wasn't the only crazy experience you had in Boston. Tell me about the time you were jumped in a car park outside a bar and got the absolute crap beaten out of you. We were at this bar back then and uh, it was called Pete's Place. And I actually was good. I was leaving early. I was on my way out of there. And my mother and my sister were still at the bar. My cousin was with me. We started to walk back. And he said, I think your mom wanted to ride home. So we turned around. We went back. As soon as I started to walk in the door, the bouncer says to me, Dana, something happened in here. I took care of it with your sister or whatever. My sister denies it to this day. But this is the truth. Because believe me, if anybody remembers, it's me. <laughs> I walk up to my sister and said, what happened? She's like, this guy just did this, that, and everything else. I want you to kick his ass. And So I, I'm like, who, who? The place is packed. And I should have known better because I'm smarter than this, but you get caught up in the, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, you know, the BS and those type of situations. So we go outside. The bar is closing. And it's packed outside. There's like all these people outside, which makes no sense. You leave and you go to your car or you go wherever you're going, you leave. So all these people are outside. And, uh, <laughs> and I uh, walk over to this guy, and I'm like, did you hit my sister? And he's like, what? No way, I would never do this, that, and the other thing. So I'm so confused. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? So my sister comes out and walks up that next to me, and he says, are you talking about this fucking bitch? Wow. And he goes like this, and like face mushed her. Your sister? Yeah, she, he gave her the... While she's standing next to you. Her face. Grabbed oh, her face and pushed her. Geez. So I hit this guy as hard as I could, and he didn't go back too far. Let's uh -huh. put it that way. He came right back after me, and every guy outside was with him. Oh, no. So these guys were a bunch of guys from Charlestown. This is what they did. They'd go out and they'd start these fights, and this was kind of their deal. And, and you know, it's well known that I, I ended up getting Meniere's. Yeah from that, from the damage I got that day. And, uh, you know, so they, they beat the shit out of me for a good 20 minutes wow. before the police came. 
It was so crazy. By the time I was done, I had no shirt on. The shorts I was wearing looked like Tarzan's loincloth. <laughs> I was all scraped up and stuff. And uh, finally, the police came. And when the police came, I ran down the parking garage, went up the elevators in this building that was there. It was on State Street in Boston. I went up the elevators and I had somebody come pick me up and I got out of there. So I never told this part of the story before, but I'm sitting at my house one day and I get a phone call and it's a lawyer. And he says, uh, you know, I'm here with my, you know, he says, I, no, he says, I represent whatever this guy's name was. And uh, the, that guy, when the police came, that kid started hitting cops and stuff. Wow. So he got arrested. This kid was a real maniac. Yeah. He, he ended up getting arrested and he was in big trouble. So they were worried that I was going to come in and testify against him in court. And I didn't even know what was happening. You know what I mean? That the court thing was going on. So they were like, so if you show up to testify in court, we're going to file charges against you because you hit him first and all this stuff. And he's, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Is he there right now with yeah. you? He's like, yes, he's sitting here in my office. So I said to him, I said, put me on speakerphone. So he puts me on speakerphone and I said, uh, I said to the kid, I said, I just want to let you know that you and every one of your friends are the biggest pussies that I've ever met in my life. You and your friends beat on me for 20 minutes. I didn't have a scratch on me. I wasn't hurt. I wasn't anything. And if I ever see you again, me and you and this and that, and then I hung up the phone on them. When the reality is, they beat the living <laughs> shit out of me. My ears were ringing so loud for three months that I thought the phone was ringing half wow. the time. And then I ended up getting Meneers from it. But that's how I ended that situation with that kid. And I always think now, the kid probably sees me on TV now and goes, we beat the shit out of that guy one night. <laughs> but they always say success is the best form of revenge. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, I think they got the better end of that one. <laughs> I think they got the better end of that one. So by the sounds of things, it seems like you never minded getting into a scrap when, when you're younger. Is any of that genetic at all? Did your father have a fighter's blood in him at all? No, I, I think that, yeah. I, you know, I come from a pretty nutty family. That's a fact. <laughs> but I, this is one of those things where, um, first of all, these things happen. Hmm. When you're young and you go out and stuff like that, fights happen, you know. I, I've never pressed charges against anybody. I've never gone to court over that. I've been taken to court mm. for fighting, but I've never, I've never done that to anybody else. When you're out there and that stuff happens, when you're out fighting in the streets, man, which I don't recommend to anybody, because I actually had a bad experience with it twice. You never, you never win. There was another experience? You, oh, yeah. So you never win. The bottom line is, when you're out fighting in the streets, you never win. Either you lose and get your ass kicked, or you win and you get your ass kicked in court. It never works out. It never... Nobody should ever have a situation where they're fighting in the street. And I learned that early, man. I, my last street fight I got in was in Boston. And uh, it was after that, after the ass kicking. I, I got into another fight and I got in a lot of trouble and ended up having to pay restitution and all kinds of stuff. So Was the outcome of that second fight worse than the first fight? Not for me. For the other person. Yeah, yeah, not for me. And that's the other thing. Going to bars and clubs are never a positive thing yet either. Tell me a night that you've ever gone out to a club or a bar where it's been absolutely positive. You've been like, wow, my life has been positively changed by going out to this club or bar. Only once when I met my wife at a nightclub. Yeah, that was the only go. time ever. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very rare that positive things come out of bars and clubs. Coming up on The Voice versus Dana White. Which UFC fighter do you think would be the first guy to step up and pee on you to save your life? Chuck Liddell. <laughs> which fighter could walk into a, let's say you're at a restaurant with your family or you're a restaurant with your friends, which fighter could walk in and make you feel the most uncomfortable? None. Nobody can make me feel uncomfortable. Nobody <laughs> makes me feel uncomfortable. After the whole Randy Couture thing, when I basically came out and said he's 100% man in the octagon and he's the furthest thing from a man outside of the octagon, he was sitting three tables over from me at a restaurant right after that. I could care less. It's a fact. What I said about him is true. What I said about him is absolutely true, and anybody who knows him knows it's true. Frank Shamrock is an idiot, and anybody who's ever met Frank Shamrock <laughs> knows he's an idiot. Tito Ortiz is a pain in the ass. Everybody in the world knows Tito Ortiz is a pain in the ass. Flip side of that, let's say you were on fire. Which UFC fighter do you think would be the first guy to step up and pee on you to save your life? Chuck Liddell. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Liddell would piss on me in a minute. <laughs> let's talk about another organization you acquired, Pride. 
The purchase of Pride was something you were very excited about at the time, but it's since been viewed as a rare misstep by some, some people calling it the most expensive tape library in history. What was it you saw about Pride that made you decide to pull the plug and cease operations only six months after the purchase? That's what separates us from everybody else, you know, that people think that that was the, the most expensive fight library in history. That's why people can't do things at the level that we do things. That was the best business move in the history of mixed martial arts. Yes, we have an awesome fight library, number one. Number two, look at the fights that were put on after we purchased that company. Look at the fights that are still happening today. Yeah after the purchase of that company. The guys who say that that was the most expensive uh, fight library in history, guys who say that it was the biggest you know, blunder in business, and, and those are the guys that just don't get it, never see the big picture, and that's why we are where we are and other people aren't. Was there something in particular though that made you stop pride and not conduct pride fights anymore? Yeah, because everything they said was bullshit. Buying that company and Doing what we were supposed to do was more difficult than when we bought the UFC. They made it difficult. They were, there, was some, there was so much sneaky shit done during the purchase of that company. It was insane. But you know what? At the end of the day, it, you know, it all worked out for us. Yeah, Pride didn't exist. It didn't keep running. When we speak of Pride, one name immediately comes to mind, Fedor Emelianenko. Now that we know Fedor is retired, that he will never fight in the UFC, that all that talk, all that speculation is over, finished, done with, all bullshit aside, how do you rate Fedor the fighter in his place in heavyweight history? Still a tough one for me, yes. He, he, was, he, he was a great heavyweight. You know, I was just watching the best of Pride the other day, mm. where he was fighting Zulu. You know, if you look at a lot of the fights that were made over in Pride, the thing that really is a shame, it's such a horrible thing in history. It's almost like, Floyd and Manny not fighting in their prime. Mm. The fact that Vidummy hold this thing out and stretched it out and did played all his goofy games that he played throughout that time, Fedor could have been over in the UFC and we could have got the best fighting the best. I wanted to ask, you know, dealing with M1 with Vadim, Vidummy as you call him, must have been a crazy experience. Can you name one of the craziest stipulations they tried to put on you for getting Fedor in the UFC? Building an arena. In Russia? Mm -hmm. They wanted us to build an arena in Russia. The thing that makes me not respect the dummy at all, I don't know, maybe it's not a good thing with me. I say everything exactly how it happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who hate me say, oh, he's lying, he's always bullshit, and he's this and that. Dude, everything I say is the truth to a fault, to, to the point where I will tell you exactly what happened in a meeting. And then I'll say it, and then he comes out and flat out lies. He lies. I've lost all respect for you, the dummy. You're a liar. Listen, if you're going to do this shit behind scenes, at least have the balls to say it in public. Say, yeah, my guy is so good, I want them to build a stadium here in Russia. Because people say you're fucking nuts. People go, you're a kook, you're nuts, and this, that, and everything else. And all the things that he wanted us to do behind the scenes that I would say publicly, he would lie about and say it wasn't true because he'd know people were thinking he was a lunatic. Did you ever get the chance to deal with Fedor himself? Did you ever get an inkling into his mentality and his emotions and how he was feeling about maybe signing with UFC? Yeah, I, I sat across the room from him. But with Vadim there? Yeah, oh, with, you know, four other guys there. Could you gauge any emotion from Fedor? None. His eyes. Guy shows him? nothing. Yeah. So you had no opportunity to probe his mind as to what his thoughts were? It all nope, came but I can tell him. you this, we offered him the most money he's been offered in his life or ever will be again. I see many similarities between you and Vince McMahon. You're both tremendously passionate about your products. You both took your products from sideshow attractions to multi-million dollar mainstream attractions. Yeah. When Vince ventured outside of wrestling with ventures like the XFL, like the World Bodybuilding Federation, he failed. I wonder, do you think you could take your entrepreneurial skills learned in the fight game and apply them outside the fight game to another business venture, non-fight related, and make it work as well as you've made the UFC work? Well, we have. I mean, we, we've, uh, you know, we've built UFC gyms. You know, no, they're not for fighters. Let's say not. Well, let's say Those non-UFC gyms. related at all. Oh, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a good question. I, 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 there's nothing else I want to do. You know, there's nothing else I want to do outside of the UFC. Actually, I understand, but do you I think actually that's... internally battle here. <laughs> to stop going outside of what it is we ex that, 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 we, that we really do. Well, that said, have you thought of other ventures? I mean, say Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta walk in here right now, knock on the door, they walk in. Dana, here's $20 million. 
Make us some more money. Do something. But outside of UFC, have you actually ever given any thought to what you might want to do outside of the fight game completely if they were to walk in and say, here's 20 mil? Well, it's pretty funny because, well, first of all, I, lo I love the television business, obviously. That's, that's what I'm in. I really, I really like television business. I love the fight game. Um, but, I, you know, I love the other thing that they're involved in, too, gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of gaming. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I could see myself getting involved in that. You've said in interviews you like to gamble like a motherfucker. Yep. And you have won and lost millions of dollars in a single night. Do you think that ability to go all in is one of the reasons you were able to build the UFC into what it is today? Yeah, I think that any, any guy who's uh, you know, an entrepreneur or, or whatever you want to call it, you've you got to have balls. You've know, you got you to gotta be willing to risk. And that's one thing that we've always had you know, in building this company. We've tried new things. A lot of things we've done have been extremely successful. And some of the things we've done have failed. Without failure, you, know, you, you, you don't know if you would have ever succeeded or not. What's the most you've ever bet on a hand of blackjack? That's a tough question because most of the limits here in Las Vegas are 50000 a hand, but you can be in a situation where you can, be, uh, you can double down, then split, so you could have anywhere from two hundred dollars to $250,000 out on one hand. Have you? I have. What's the attraction of gambling so much? Is it the thrill of the adrenaline rush? Is it the thrill of the risk? And if it is the thrill, the rush, does it concern you that you can't get this rush anywhere else, that you have to put down hundreds of thousands of dollars on a blackjack table to get this rush? No, I, you know, there's definitely a rush, but you could get a rush a million different ways, man. You know, keep your money and fucking bungee jump off the stratosphere down the street. But you can know? you get your rush a hundred different ways? No, it's different for me. The, 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 and it's not, it's not as much gambling as it is blackjack. Hmm. You know, I like blackjack and... You know, I, there's no doubt if I want to watch a game, it's a little more fun if you got some money on it, you know. But I, uh, I love the one-on-one -on -one battle between me and the house. I, I really love it. I love the battle between me and the house. I've always been into it since I was a little kid. When I was a kid, Vegas was a much different place. Um, you could walk into the casinos and you could, you know, I used to go to the casinos and I used to watch guys play big money all the time. Mm -hmm. I could stand there for hours and watch. I still can even if I'm not playing, I can watch a guy go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the house for big money. I like to watch it. Up next on The Voice Versus. All right, I'm going to do an interview with you here real quick because I do this with every Australian. Some true or false questions for you. True or false? You're terrified of the ocean and of sharks. That's true. Um, I love the ocean, but man, there's just something about getting in there and dropping to the bottom of the food chain that freaks me out. <laughs> you wouldn't last long in Australia. <laughs> oh. I won't put my big fucking toe in the water in Australia. Now, we go to some places because we go on Lorenzo's boat and stuff, mm -hmm. and I, I have a house down in Laguna Beach. I go in the ocean. I do go in the ocean, but... We go to Australia. Australia is like going back to prehistoric days. It is. Now, everything on the planet, and I've done this. All right, I'm going to do an interview with you here real quick because mm -hmm. I do this with every Australian. How many friends do you know that have been messed up by spiders, being bit by spiders? Yes. You know somebody? Mm -hmm. You know anybody that's ever been attacked by a shark? Uh, through a friend, yes. You ever know anybody that's ever been um, bitten by a crocodile? Uh, again, through a person, through a person, yes. Jellyfish. Yeah, yes. Right? Uh-huh. And then what's my last one? There's always a last one that I have. Snakes. Snake. Brown snake, tiger snake. Yes. You're snake. five out of five. Mm -hmm. I've never interviewed anybody. And everywhere, everywhere I go, television executives, the, the, the waiter or waitress at the, at, the, at the restaurant, no matter where I go, it's three out of five in Australia. Five out of five, brother. Fuck that shit. <laughs> okay? I will never... Ever <laughs> swim in Australia, dude. Ever. True or false? You once tipped the dealer at the Palms one hundred thousand dollars. It's true. I hate talking about this stuff, but it's true. I bought a guy a car once too. A car? Mm hmm. Who? What? For what? A dealer. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I won a million dollars and I bought him a car. True or false? When you began going to Japan to get a UFC show over there, due to death threats from the yakuza your name was actually not put on the flight manifests when flying to Japan. That might be true. 
True or false, after Brock retired from UFC, he went to WWE, then came back to you and asked for a mega million dollar payday to return and you and Lorenzo laughed him out of your office. Not true. True or false, Vince McMahon once tried to buy the UFC. That's true, before we owned it. Yeah. Follow up to that. Actually, it was Shane. Shane. Shane wanted to buy the That's UFC. Interesting. Vince did not. That's interesting. My follow up was going to be, what do you think would have happened if Vince had bought it back in... 2001 or whatever we tried to do it now that it's Shane same question what do you think would have happened if Shane yeah. got his hands on it I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now that's yeah. for sure yeah Shane wanted to buy it Vince shot it down true or false your famous do you want to be a fucking fighter speech from tough season one was in response to fighters asking if they paid for appearing on the show true true or false Frank Fertitta once badly injured your ankle during a jiu-jitsu training session that's true <laughs> yeah that's true. It still clicks every time I walk now. Which ankle? The right one? Yeah. <laughs> true or false, you average three to four hours of sleep a night. True. True or false, you once lived with Mark Wahlberg for a few months. True. True or false, Mark Wahlberg once told you off for staring at Robert De Niro in public. <laughs> no. No, he didn't tell me off. What happened was that we were doing a movie. It was the life story of Vinnie Curto. Mm-hmm. And Mark Wahlberg was Vinnie Curto. And... Uh, and De Niro was, was uh, Angelo Dundee. Mm-hmm. So Angelo Dundee came in that day and he was telling stories and De Niro was filming him. And uh, dude, it's fucking Robert De Niro. You know what I mean? My, my jaw would be hanging to the ground, right my tongue there, out. Yeah. Right? So I guess I kept staring at him. <laughs> and we went to lunch and when we came back from lunch, Mark goes, dude, you gotta stop staring at Bobby, freaking him out. You're freaking him out. You da, da, da. I said, dude, it's fucking Robert De Niro. He goes, you can't come back in if you're gonna keep, I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll stop staring at him. True or false, you bench press over 300 pounds. That's true. True or false, you once pitched a TV drama about organized crime in South Boston. It's true, and not only did I pitch it, we filmed it and uh, filmed it, shot it, and then I took my name off it and, you know, it aired, but without me being involved. It did air? Yeah, it didn't go the way that I wanted it to go. The director that we hired was the wrong guy, and uh, the thing ended up being a huge clusterfuck, and I pulled out of it. True or false, Shaquille O'Neal was at one point terrorizing you for a shot in the UFC. That's true. He wanted to fight Hong Man Choi, I believe. He, he, he just wanted to fight. You know, I think Shaq went through that little thing too where he, 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 he fell in love with the sport and was passionate about it and, and, and felt like he wanted to get a fight in the, in, in the UFC. But it just it doesn't make sense for him. It just doesn't make sense for what he does. If you didn't have the strict business morals that you have with the UFC and the, the, the vision you have for it, and you wanted to put on a freak show just to pull in ratings, and you could put any celebrity in a fight in the octagon, who would you want to put in there? Any celebrity? I mean, if I, if I was really going to put any celebrity in there to fight somebody, this almost happened too. I, I don't know how many people know this, but um, Joe Rogan was going to fight, uh, you know, they were trying to get me to set up this fight with him and, uh, what's his name, uh, Wesley Snipes. Really? That yeah. was almost going to happen. No, that was really, they were really trying to get me to make that happen. Wow. Wesley Snipes people, you know, because he, uh, he had a bunch of tax problems yeah. back then, and uh, he wanted to fight Joe Rogan. And I, I told Joe, and Joe's like, dude, I will fight that guy in two seconds, you know what I mean? <laughs> make that happen or whatever. So we started talking about it, and uh, it just sort of fell apart. How would it have gone down? Do Wesley think? Snipes didn't want to fight him. No, Joe would have wrecked him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True or false, the idea for The Ultimate Fighter came from the Fertitta's appearance on the reality series American Casino. No, so what happened was the uh, American Casino was Craig Poligian. Craig Poligian produced American Casino right. for the Fertitas, and he's the producer of The Ultimate Fighter. So when this thing was friggin' bleeding money, we started figuring out, we wanted to figure out how to get on television. We had to get, people didn't want live fights on TV. They wouldn't do it. So we came up with the ultimate fighter as the Trojan horse and the, the relationship with Pelagian already, we went and talked to him about it. True or false, you had tickets to game four of the 2004 American League Championship Series where the Red Sox staged an epic comeback and went on not only to beat the hated Yankees, my team by the way, but also ended their 86 year championship drought. You went to the game, but left early because it was cold <laughs> and the Sox were losing. Is it true that it's your biggest regret <laughs> as a diehard Red Sox fan? <laughs> that's false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was freezing out, man. I didn't dress right. And I'm like, they're losing, it's freezing. 
and Amati. <laughs> I left, and they came back and won the game. Yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was pretty bad. Coming up on the Voice versus Dana White. Can the UFC right now, right at this moment, can the UFC survive without Dana White? Can the UFC right now, right at this moment, can the UFC survive without Dana White? Yes. The UFC is McDonald's. The guy who didn't, the guy who was, you know, who started McDonald's and it's like Dave Thomas and Wendy's, you know, Wendy's is still kicking ass and doing great. The UFC is at a level now where, yeah, it can, it can live without me. Since you've taken over the UFC and built it to the monstrosities today, what do you consider the biggest mistake you've made or the biggest regret you have? Hmm. I don't think there have been any. I mean, if there were so many really big, bad mistakes, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here today. I, it's just, I think, I think that we've, I think everything that we've done, good or bad, has gotten us to where we are today. But if you could hop in a DeLorean and go back in time and just change one incident, would you? I wouldn't. I wouldn't change one thing. Everything that's happened, even the bad stuff, you know, at the time when it was going on, I'm like, oh my God, this is so fucking bad. This is so terrible and blah, blah, blah. But it led us to where we are here today. Everything that we've done has led us here, good or bad. And out of all the achievements, many of them over the years, which is the one to do with the UFC you're most proud of? Fox. Yeah. No doubt about it. I mean, if you look at when we bought this company, People said we'd never get it back on pay-per-view. Television was hysterical. You think you're going to get this on television? And one of the biggest media companies in the world was absolutely, undoubtedly impossible. We spoke about Don King earlier. Don King had his pinnacle fight, most would say, Rumble in the Jungle. Zaire, 1974. Ali, Foreman. Have you had your Rumble in the Jungle? Have you had your Zaire moment? Or is it still yet to come? Still yet to come, I think. We've had those moments earlier on, though. I mean, we had our, you know, Chuck Tito, um, you know, fights like that that people were chomping at the bit for years to see because Tito was refusing to fight Chuck, and then finally when it happened, it was huge for us at the time. You know what I mean? Um, but I think we're still waiting for our huge, and I, and I think that fight will be one of our super fights, whether it's Anderson GSP or Anderson John Jones. That'll be my, my Zaire. Dana fucking White, thank you so much for joining me on The Voice First. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Can you feel the beat?